Hello, congregation. Welcome once again to another bone snapping edition of the Boner. Grab your Bible, something to write on, something to write with. Open up an application, open up another browser, grab your Bible because we here at the Boneyard want you to follow along with us because we believe in sola scriptura, which is Latin, and it means scriptures and scriptures alone. We like to keep things in context because taking things out of context is pretext and that is error. So to open up your Bible, if you've been following along with us in our series of John, you know we're knee deep in good, rich theology in the book of John, John chapter 6. Let's do a little review. If you remember last time when you tuned in on this awesome Bible television show, you remember our hero, Jesus, as he was walking in the mountain wilderness and he sat down on a mountain and he feeds the 5,000. No, many theologians and scholars and commentaries say 5,000 is only the number of the men, the head of household that were present. That does not include the children, the women, the, the, the people who were just not of age yet. They could have reached into the, 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 the 10,000s and the 20,000s. But Jesus, using the very hands that he used to create, the take the dust of the earth and blowing it to create a living human being, takes the five loaves and two fish and breaks apart and creates a feast in a barren place. Picking up in John chapter 6, let us continue this good, rich Bible study as we investigate the man known as Jesus, who he was, what his claims are, and what does it matter to someone like me? So picking up in John chapter 6, grab your Bible, chapter 6, verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and he had given thanks. He distributed to them who were seated, also the fish, as much as they wanted. Notice the writer, the evangelist John, as he writes the story, he tells us they had as much as they wanted. See, John's motive was not to tell us to come to Christ that we'll be filled with the things of this world. We know what the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto them. But notice these people who were just following Jesus because he was magical. They were curious about this Jesus as he lays hands on the blind, as he lays hands on the lame they could walk they were curious about this Jesus Jesus made no demands on them but this Jesus had compassion on these people who were following Jesus for the wrong motives they were being filled being fed by his very hands and you'll see that their attitude towards Jesus changes and Jesus's attitude towards them will change what about you boneyard do you only follow Jesus because he fills you. Congregation, do you only run and chase after Jesus because he finances your idolatry? Oh, yes, we'll, we'll follow Jesus as long as we have a good job and we can pay our mortgage. Oh, we'll follow Jesus as long as we're healthy, wealthy, and wise. But let a little storm come our way. Let a little earthquake tremble our foundation. Let, a, let, let us be challenged in our doctrine and our, our theology. Let us, let us rub the lamp of Jesus and he not answer our wishes and our whims and our wants. We'll throw Jesus down and chase something else. We just come to Jesus because some preacher tells us to invest $58 in a ministry and we'll have a year of wealth, health, and, and, and divine wisdom. We, we come to Jesus because some preacher tells us our lives will be perfect. We'll have prosperity. Our, our wallets will be swelling. We come to Jesus because he's a genie in a bottle. This is not the, the story of the gospel. We don't run to Jesus when he holds out his arms to hug us and we frisk him down to grab blessings and to promote ourselves or to get things from Jesus. We don't come to the, the, the holy of holies and expect God to stick his hand from behind the, the curtain to give us blessings while ignoring his face. We come to Jesus because we consider him priceless. We come to Jesus because he's precious. We come to Jesus because he's the grand jewel, the pearl. He is the, the, he's the crown jewel of salvation. He is the highlight of humanity. We come to Jesus because he is the substitute for our sins. He is the propitiation. He is the one who laid down his life instead of us. We come to Jesus for the sake of of Jesus, not what we can get out of Jesus, not for a, a political stance. We don't go to church to promote our business, to rub shoulders with the elite. 
to use our religion as a stamp of a, a public approval to say, yes, I go to church. I go to church with governor so-and-so, president so-and-so. I'm, I'm on the deacon board. We don't use our religion. We don't use our walk with Christ as an accessory. We don't use it to car compartmentalize our life. Say, yeah, Jesus, you have me for an hour on Sunday. Then I have to shoot to the Chinese buffet before the Baptists get there. We don't use Jesus as something to promote ourselves. We come to Jesus for him. We come to Jesus for him, for, his, for him, who he is. Many of us, as you remember in our last episode, would be happy to go to heaven. If we could go there and all our friends were there, food was there, we could eat all we want and not get fed. We could spend our whole eternity with good health. We could have 70 degree weather with a slight breeze. But the only thing, Jesus wouldn't be there. Many Christians would jump at the opportunity to go to that kind of heaven. However, a true disciple, a true Christian knows that heaven is heaven because Christ is there. That Jesus is there. That anything less than the being in the presence of Jesus is not even heaven. But many of us would love to have that place. Many of us want to go to heaven and we hope when we get there that Jesus is nowhere to be found. We hope that Jesus is not there because we lived a life where we ignored him or we use him as an accessory, almost like a new pocketbook, or use him like a, a covering to, to, to look the part, but not knowing him at all. We know the facts of Jesus, what he looked like, where he lived, the food that he ate, and even some of the sayings, but we don't know Jesus. And worst of all, Jesus doesn't know us. But as these people who were being fed by the hand of the master, Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated. Also the fish as much as they wanted. Verse 12, and when they have eaten their full, their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. See, it was Hebrew tradition to leave a loaf of bread or a piece of bread on the table after you've ate. To, to show that the blessings of God, that God will provide. To remind you the next time you sit down to eat, as the Jewish culture taught, that God provides. But Jesus even shows in this tradition that he's able to feed those who are hungry. Imagine Jesus had, he had compassion on this crowd who have been fasting many days and following after Jesus. He was moved with compassion. That is his very nature. And some of those were following Jesus out of curiosity. Some were following him because he was a miracle maker. He could do great wonders. They weren't consumed with his message and who he was. They were just following after him, looking a hand up. But Jesus still had compassion on them. They were weak, hungry, and could be swayed and could be faint. So Jesus fed the masses. But Jesus fed these ones who had not ate for many days. And they ate till they were full. Can you imagine? Our, our Christ, the Messiah, the God of all, breaking bread and the fish to feed these hungry people who have an appetite to sit down and eat until they were full. Notice Andrew, he, he set the table. He said, maybe they'll get a piece of a fish. Maybe it'll be a little bit. Maybe, maybe Philip was moved and he said, well, we only have two pieces of fish and five loaves of bread. This will insult a people of this mag that magnitude, just a crumb. But Jesus fed them until they were full. Notice, this is the evangelist speaking to our soul that Jesus is able to give us life, a life full and abundant. But notice, it's not the life that satisfies us as the disciples and the Christian. It's the one who gives it. It's Jesus. He's the source. If the people had common sense and realized it's not the food that satisfies you for the moment, but it's Jesus who satisfies for a lifetime, they were just following Jesus because he fed them that day. How many of us? How many of us with our carnal attitudes would think, well, I'll follow Jesus because he'll, he'll take care of me right now and through this situation. I'll have jailhouse Christianity. He'll get me through, brother. I'm trusting Jesus. And the next time you see us or them, they forgot about Christ. They forgot about Christ. They forgot about how he brought them through. Like this crowd that's following Jesus now, once Jesus turns and makes demands on them, 
You'll notice they won't follow him anymore. It, right now it's easy to follow him. He, he's nurturing them, strengthening them for the journey. But Jesus will make demands on his own disciples eventually. But when Christ makes those demands, that we trust and follow him and him only, that we throw down our sins, that's where the meat meets the metal. That's where the, the rubber meets the road. That's when the true disciples are seen. As we continue, Jesus says, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from five barley loaves left to those who had, who had eaten. Jesus gathers up the broken pieces, not letting anything go to waste. Now, I don't know what happened to these 12 baskets. It could have been that the little boy who took the food in the first place could have took them home. Or maybe each disciple got to take a basket with him, a snack pack to carry with him. I don't know. But this is to show us that Jesus is able. Jesus is able to provide. He's able. We don't have to trust Geico. We don't have to trust our 401k. We don't even have to trust the government. We can trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. He's able to provide. This is his lesson to the, these disciples to show that he will provide. As we continue, verse 14, And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who has to come into the world. The people are noticing. Their bellies are full. These Jewish people who were in the, su the, southern, in the northern part of the Galilee Sea, they were there and they see that this Jesus doing great works. They remember what Moses says in Deuteronomy 18.15, that a prophet will rise up. These people were noticing that this man does great miraculous works. Surely this is the prophet. Notice they called him prophet, but Jesus always called himself the son of man. He is the savior, the lamb, but they called him prophet. They hadn't fully realized who Jesus is yet, but they were yet closer than the Pharisees. They were yet closer realizing who Jesus was. The Pharisees were throwing stones from glass houses saying, you're of above, hell's above, you're the devil, you're, you're breaking God's law, you're blasphemous. But these common people were closer to realizing who Jesus was than the religious. I don't know about in your city or in your church or your community or your neighborhood. But in my city, there's many Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes and lawyers who are religious. You know who I'm talking about. They're religious. It's like they have starch in their hair. Like they look like they sucked on a lemon to get a smile out of them. They're self-righteous. And they use the scriptures as a machete instead of as a, a scalpel to cut out sin. You use it as a weapon. They use their translations and they argue and debate over doctrine and theology. While the world around them is on fire and people are sprinting towards hell. They rather debate with other Christians about wearing ties and what should you do on Easter Sunday and if you should immerse or sprinkle. They, they argue with, amongst themselves why people are starving for the gospel. The religious, but these common people, the common ones knew. They said there's something about this Jesus. He's a prophet. Uh, they're, they're on the brink of knowing who Jesus is. They're on the brink, but now... They see that this Jesus is something special. They know that Jesus is, is sent, sent from heaven. He must be the prophet. But these Jews who are saying these things have a motive. They have a reason. They, they're looking for a Messiah to put on a pedestal to rebel against Rome. They want a Messiah, almost someone to, to be a poster boy. Someone to, to, to be the icon of their just cause. As you read here, they begin in verse 15. Jesus said, Jesus perceiving they were about to come and make him by force, make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. These people that Jesus broke the bread for and the fish are now coming to make Jesus king over Jerusalem and over Israel and over God's chosen people by force. Even if Jesus resisted, they were going to hike him up on their shoulders and make him king. Now Jesus is face to face with the very temptation that he heard from Satan. Bow, and I'll give you all these nations. See, Satan was trying to give Jesus an inheritance without a sacrifice. He was trying to give Jesus the nations of the world without a cross. But Jesus knew better. But 
How many of us can relate to these, these people who are fed by Jesus? We want Jesus to be our poster boy. We want Jesus to be our mascot. He could be our mascot for recycling, being nice to people and moral. He could be our mascot. Whatever our cause is, whatever we stand for, whether it's abused animals or, or uh, spouse abuse, whatever our cause is, we can make Jesus our mascot. We can have Jesus on the sidelines with pom-poms saying, yeah, rah, rah, rah. Well, we go along with our own agenda. Many churches, many ministries are the same way. They should be focusing on Jesus instead of just letting Jesus be a poster boy, letting Jesus be the, the guy that you, you get behind and push all along being for your own agenda. Many times we, we pray to God and we ask God to be for us. Be what we're doing, God. Be behind us. Be what we're, we're feeding the, the hungry. Be for us as we clothe the naked. God, be for us. However, we should be praying, God, let us do what you're doing. Let us be behind you and what you're already doing. Let us be a part of what you're doing instead of begging God to be a part of what we're doing. Many of us are just building our own kingdoms, our own churches, our own ministries. We're trying to just look out for our own families and we're using Jesus as a mascot. We want Jesus, we force him to be king, to look like the Jesus as our just cause and use Jesus' face and his name to make our own popularity expound. That's what we're guilty of. But notice what Jesus does. He withdraws himself. He goes to the mountain by himself. He gets away from these people because Jesus knows his objective. See, our greatest worry for people who are individual and even for our churches is to secede in things that don't even matter while neglecting the things that do matter. Many churches pick up a social gospel. We pick up things that don't even matter, succeeding in gathering a crowd while ignoring the gospel. We're really good at organization and programs. We're really good at getting together a good concert. Our smoke machines are awesome and our light shows. And hey, our coffee is off the chain. You need to come check out our Starbucks brew. You need to come check out our pews, how they have lazy boy recliners, whatever. But we ignore the gospel. We're really good at being majors in the minors, but forgetting the gospel. Notice Jesus were through. He doesn't want anything to do with that. He's not going to, he's not going to be king without a cross. He's, he's getting away from that crowd because their agenda is not the gospel. Jesus will always withdraw himself away from those who want a king for their own agenda. But we should come to the king of kings and bow. Bow at the foot of the cross, at the foot of Christ, where he pour out himself on our account. Notice Jesus were through and his disciples. What do they do? Now, they could have hung out with these people because they were looking for a Messiah just like they were. They were looking for a Messiah to rebel against Rome, to fight against the oppression, to stand up for the little guy. They were looking for a Messiah just like that also. But notice what the disciples do in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across to the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Notice the disciples withdrew. They got away from these people who had an agenda to make Jesus king over their rebellion against Rome. The disciples. Maybe you're not in ministry. Maybe you're not in, in standing with, within a literal pulpit in your church. But don't throw your weight behind other agendas other than the gospel. You're saying, Kevin, it's important about abused animals. It's important about spouse abuse. It's even important about political issues. Yes, I know that. But once the gospel is rightly preached and it grasps the heart of a man... It, all those things will be a byproduct. When they listen to the gospel, it changes the man's attitude, who he walks with his friends. It changes his environment. It changes his speech. It changes everything about that man. The main issue is the gospel, and the disciples knew this. They knew Jesus wasn't going to be a ploy, a, a part of a plot to, to, to fight against Rome. Josephus tells us around this time, around 30 AD, that there was many people who rose up to fight against Rome, to rebel, and they came in their own name, and they gathered many followers. Barabbas is just one of the many people who rose up to fight against Rome. 
And Jesus would have no part of that. He knew his purpose. He knew why he was there as he stepped down out of the ivory towers of heaven to go amongst nasty, wretched, wicked men to die in their place, in their stead. Jesus died for his people in a relentless pursuit of his people. Now, the disciples knew. They knew the mission. The, the, they knew the mission, but that doesn't mean that they, they, they didn't waver. They, didn't, they weren't weak and they, they didn't stumble. And we'll see here a naked account of when they needed Jesus. As we begin in verse 17, they got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was the city that Jesus decided to be the capital of his ministry. He mainly went to Capernaum. And the disciples knew, well, we don't know where he is, so we're going to get in this boat and get away from these guys. Get to Capernaum and get there, and Jesus will meet us there eventually. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come. Look at verse 18. And the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Verse 19. And when they had rowed out three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. Notice as we see the seasoned fishermen. As they're, they're, they're grown men and they cast out the boat. Now, if these seasoned fishermen, who many of them who grew up on the water, if they knew that there was a storm brewing, they probably wouldn't cast out. They knew when they stepped out on the shore that, hey, we're going to go to Capernaum. But as they got three or four miles out, notice in this landscape that the, the wind would rush down into this area and cause violent storms. And they're three or four miles out. They're, they're fighting against the storm. Maybe their sails were ripped. And we can see here that they, they even broke out the oars. They were rowing. They used the wind to get where they need to go. But the wind was counter where the, they were going. Now they were in this boat and they're fighting. And they were, they were pretty confident fishermen. They were pretty confident. They lived on the water. They, the, notice the scripture doesn't say that they were afraid of the waves. They weren't afraid of the water, but they were in the middle of a storm. Can you imagine in your mind's eye as Jesus noticed his disciples as he's praying from the mountaintop, withdrawn. He sees his disciples in the middle of a storm three or four miles out. And now we see Jesus walking on the water. See, Jesus is showing his deity as he, ex he goes beyond physics and he goes beyond the natural laws. He, he, he's a better Moses. Just like Jesus broke the bread on the side of the mountain like Moses did with the manna. As Jesus breaks the bread and feeds the crowd, Moses did the same in the Old Testament. Now, Moses in the Old Testament also cried out to God and God split the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. But this Jesus, this Jesus who does great works as we read in Psalms 107 verse 23 to 24, he does great works. This Jesus is now showing he's a better Moses as he walks on the water. As he gets in a relentless pursuit for his disciples, whether you're like John on the island of Patmos, or like Silas and Paul locked up in a dungeon somewhere. There's nothing that would separate us from the love of Christ, not even a storm. Maybe you're saying, but Jesus is nowhere around. I'm in the middle of my storm. I'm in my boat, and I think I got everything all together, but Jesus is nowhere to be found. Notice when they saw Jesus in verse 19, saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, they were frightened. Why were they frightened? It doesn't say they were scared of the, the wind. They weren't afraid of the rain. Yes, it was a challenge. It was a storm. There is a, a chance they'll be capsized. There, there's a chance they could drown. They, they respect the situation they were in. But when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they were afraid. Congregation, what about you? What about the storms of life that you're in? Maybe you're in the middle of a storm and the boat's rocking, you're holding on, and you're not really afraid because you've been through storms before. You're seasoned, you're, you've gathered, but you, you see something that you haven't seen before. You see an apparition. You see a ghost on the water. You see something walking closer. See, Jewish tradition and fishermen always taught if you see a ghost on the water, 
that it's an omen, that something bad is about to happen. But many of us, we're going through the storms of life and we, we see Jesus and we, we get scared because that's not, not how Jesus should operate. Just like the woman at the well when he said, you're the bread of, you're, you're the water of life, you're, you're the living water, but you don't have any buckets. She, she accused this Jesus who can walk on water that he don't have any buckets. How could he reach the bottom of the well? Or this, or this man who was, who was lame at the, the, the pool of Bethesda. He said, I don't have any friends who can pick me up and put me in the pool. I don't have any options. I don't know anyone to help me. Or like Moses, or like Mary said, I know not no man. How can I conceive a child? This Jesus, this Jesus is operating in a place that you are not used to seeing and it scares you. You're in the middle of your storm and, and Jesus is showing up and it frightens you. The question is, will you take Jesus into your boat? Or you'll say, no, Jesus, stay outside this boat. You can't get in this boat. You're not doing it the right way. You're not doing it the right way. You're not providing for my family the right way. No, Jesus, stay out on the boat. But notice what Jesus does. But when he draws, he said unto them, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus comforts his disciples. He says, yo, 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 it's me. It's me. Jesus comforts his disciples. However, in whatever situation you're in, maybe you're saying, Kevin, I read about this comforter. I read about the Holy Spirit, how he comforts his disciples. But the actuality, the truth is, I live a comfortable life anyway. You really don't need a comforter if you're not being persecuted. You're living a comfortable, comfortable life. You're a practical atheist. What if it was true that God didn't exist? Then your life wouldn't be much different. You need a comforter if you're going through persecution. Now step back and look at your own life. Are you in a boat and you're holding on? And if Jesus showed up, would it scare you? It should scare you because there is a story where Jesus calls Peter outside the boat to teach him that we can walk in places we shouldn't. We can do things that it, it confuses the world. It, people should be confounded and confused by the Christian's love for his enemies. Confounded and confused as he lays down his life to serve a living God. Notice as Jesus walks on the water, he steps into the boat in verse 21. And they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. As we take Christ and we trust in him and lean upon him, not worry about the storms, and clinging to him, clinging to Christ, will be at our destination. Trusting in him, trusting the peacemaker, repenting your sins, and trusting Jesus. He is the only way to get to heaven.